All right, welcome everyone. February 13th, 2023 meeting of the WVU Faculty Senate will come to order. We do have a quorum. The minutes from the January 9th meeting have been distributed uh, along with uh, the agenda. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Hearing none, the minutes are approved as written. Uh, we'll begin today with a report from President Gordon Key. Hello, everyone. Oh, come on. Let's get with it. Happy Valentine's Day, okay? Uh, man, it's, it's, it's a good day. To, it's a good day. The sun is shining. The, the, the wind is blowing. I mean, uh, the weather is much nicer than it generally is this time of the year. So let's welcome that. And I'm, uh, and I'm going to be very short today, uh, Scott, because of the fact that uh, I know that we have a number of of reports and the provost, uh, the provost says that I stole all of her stuff, so I'm going to give it back to her. I know, just uh, that's the way that it is. But uh, I, I do want to make a couple of notes. First of all, um, we are um, nearly two thirds of our way through a legislative session, uh, and you'll hear from uh, Travis Mollahan, who uh, it represents us very effectively. In fact, we have a uh, we have a great uh, group of folks who represent the university and. Uh, and do it very effectively. And I just want to acknowledge them and thank them for the good work that they do. Um, and then, uh, as you know, um, the, the state, uh, our, our priorities obviously are to, to make certain that we get money in support of our deferred maintenance. We think that that's very important. We have other uh, programs that we are, that we're talking, uh, that we're focused on, but our, our, our number one issue, obviously, is to make certain that we, uh, we maintain our, our funding sources and that we, uh, and that we uh, are able to uh, implement the, uh, the, uh, funding, um, the funding policy that was developed last year by the, by, the, uh, by the legislature. And that will be very, very, very helpful to our university. Uh, one of the things that we've focused on, obviously, is the success of our students. In fact, we, we are very committed, and you'll hear this from my own uh, report. I've been doing a series of, uh, I've been doing a series of uh, focus groups with students, finding out what, what is it that, what is it that you want? What is it you think about this university? What should we be doing? Um, I will talk more about that in my State of the University address, but uh, I will tell you this, our students love our institution, but they do have a lot of ideas. And a lot of expectations, and this is a different. This is a different uh, post. The post-pandemic world is very different. I want all of you to know that nothing is the same. And uh, the faster we realize that, and the faster we adapt to it, and the faster that we get ahead of it, the better off we're going to be as an institution. Um, so one of the things is increasing student success uh, is such a high priority that the we just received a million dollar gift courtesy of the mayor foundation aimed at reducing the number of students who leave campus before graduation obviously retention this gift will support a new retention effort called the mountaineer completion grant program which will provide financial assistance to students at risk of leaving the university in their final year of study that's when we lose some that we should not be losing obviously so this program by the way has shown up to an 87 percent success rate in helping students and other institutions um, complete their education. We certainly want to have that be our be our own. We, we have a goal of having a ninety percent completion rate, but we'll we'll have to stretch to get there in the next couple of years. Um, secondly of all, we have two new leaders of at at our institution at Potomac State. Uh, Dr. Chris Gilmer has been uh, appointed permanently to that position. As you know, Chris is a is a graduate. Um, uh, a college graduate who became a leader in higher education, is a published author, an advocate for underserved students, is um, transitioning from interim to campus president at the Potomac State. And then we also have um, appointed Dr. T. Ramon Stewart as the, as the president of our Beckley campus. And Ramon comes to us uh, from Clayton State University. He is a graduate, uh, he's a graduate of West Virginia University, um, is from McDowell County. And so he is back in in his home area, in his home um, in his home um, territory, for which we are very grateful because he will carry a very important message. During the legislative session, it's also important that uh, the the state uh, and our leadership see the educational and 
research capacities of the institution. Our um, undergraduate research uh, program was just at the Capitol this past week. We had West Virginia University Day. Um, a lot of our uh, a lot of our programs were on display. Did a wonderful job, and most importantly, I think um, um, we have shown uh, the continuing growth and capacity of the university. So I'm grateful for the students. I'm grateful for the faculty who came. I'm grateful for all of you for making certain that the university is very well represented in Charleston. Saying all of that, uh, I'm open for any questions that any of you may have. Seeing none, I will turn it back to you, Scott. Thank you, President Gee. Next item on the agenda is a report on the provost, Marianne Reed. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are all doing well on this beautiful, sunny Monday afternoon. Um, I have a few things to cover. I'll try to be as brief as possible. First, I want to say a few words about the budget, um, just a few, since our Vice President of Finance, Paula Congelio, will be giving a more detailed report in a bit, um, but it's relevant um, to what I want to talk about. So um, you may have heard from your deans and your chairs that we are facing a particularly challenging budget situation this spring. Um, and one reason for our current budget challenge is a decline in the university's overall enrollment. Uh, we've seen small declines in retention and persistence post-COVID, but the big thing is we've been graduating larger classes, um, and you'll hear more about that in a moment. Um, but the good news is that our fall 2023 20, uh, first-time freshman enrollment um, is on an uptick, and our fall to spring retention is the highest it's been in five years at 92.4%. But we can't take our foot off the pedal just yet. And over the next few months, we will need to do everything we can to bring in a robust fall freshman class and to retain the students who are already here. Um, and I will say that enrollment will continue to be a challenge for us in the years ahead. Um, you know, I would suggest you bring um, the Education Advisory Board back to Senate. Um, sometime soon to talk about that uh, demographic cliff that we're facing over the next three years. So the context for that is why improving student success outcomes will continue to be a priority during year three of academic transformation, which started in January. We have several initiatives in this area um, aimed at undergraduate students. They include that completion grants program that President Gee was talking about. We're really excited about having funding to pilot that because we know um, that it does help students stay in school to give them that little bit of extra financial aid um, to cover their last mile. Uh, we are going to be piloting our REACH program, pilot, uh, piloting that in fall. And this is a program that will provide wraparound support to students who are particularly vulnerable for, um, for not retaining at the university, first generation, Pell Grant eligible, uh, minoritized students, um, those students who need that little bit of extra support. Um, just something that I learned recently that I think you might find interesting, it may surprise you. Did you know that 40% of our freshman class has an estimated family contribution of less than $10,000 a year? Let that sink in for a minute. We have students who are financially challenged, and that affects every aspect of their experience here. So we're going to really focus our energy um, on helping lift up those students. But I thought it's just something you want to think about when you walk into your class. When your students can't afford books or don't have, or can't buy the books, I mean, that is part of the reason. They are making decisions about whether to pay their rent or to buy books. And so that is something that we need to work on as a campus, and we will continue to um, also work on that through our fundraising efforts. We're gonna be very su strong supporters of the Eberly College's STEM Instructional Collaborative um, that is focused on um, elevating the teaching of those introductory STEM classes where students typically struggle. And I know the Eberly College is already um, searching for a director and forming work groups to work on very specific STEM courses. So um, we will support that in every way we can. Um, we are also implementing a number of initiatives to support graduate student success. These include the new modification of duties policy for graduate assistants, 
that provides up to six weeks of leave for students experiencing life-changing events such as having a baby or dealing with a, a serious family illness. We are now recruiting for an ombudsman who will provide confidential, impartial, and in, informal conflict resolution and problem-solving assistance for all graduate students. The Office of Graduate Affairs is forming a graduate and professional student advisory board and wellness committee to advocate for policies and practices that promote the mental health, resilience, and empowerment of WVU grad students. And there, there are many other initiatives under Graduate Affairs um, designed to support our graduate students and our graduate student assistants who are so important to our teaching and research mission. In partnership with faculty and college leadership, we also want to strengthen the experiential learning component of our curriculum, ensuring that our students have access to and get credit for hands-on opportunities such as internships and co-ops, undergraduate research, and community engagement. It's a strong selling point to prospective students when we tell them that they can gain the education and the experience that will help them in their chosen careers. And we want to help our students get good jobs when they graduate. This year, we will be reviewing career readiness programs, both centrally and across campus, to determine how we can best ensure that all students have access to relevant career counseling and job placement opportunities. As part of academic transformation, we will also need to continue our work to identify instructional and programmatic efficiencies so that we can have the resources to invest in areas of strength and opportunity and to support faculty research, travel, and professional development. To that end, our team recently wrapped up our portfolio review of graduate programs at WVU, and we will soon be presenting our preliminary recommendations to the colleges. This has been a very iterative process over the past year in which members of our team met with college leaders multiple times and, and with the Office of Research to share data and learn more about these programs and how they contribute to both student learning and the university's research and land grant mission. We will be continually updating our academic transformation initiatives and progress on the Provost Office Academic Transformation website and providing Faculty Senate with regular updates as well. Tis the season for faculty awards and recognition. And as a reminder, the deadline for university faculty award submissions is this Friday, February 17th. This includes the university's top awards for outstanding teaching, research, and service. Uh, faculty will uh, also receive a reminder this week that the long form scholarship celebration will be held on March 29th at 4 p.m. in the Milano Room of the WVU Libraries. And finally, also for your calendar, the Benedum Scholars Celebration is scheduled for April 12th at 7 p.m. at the Creative Arts Center in the Gladys Davis Theater. And I would highly encourage you to come. Um, this is a great event, um, which our faculty um, share uh, their research, but also their inspiration for research. And it's very fast paced and uh, it's a great celebration of our, of our best scholars. Many of you are likely aware about the chat GBT the AI tool that can be used to generate long form content with just a couple of prompts. This is a hot topic at universities around the country with faculty um, rightly expressing concerns that students will be able to use the tool to generate high quality research papers without being traced. I've tasked Associate Provost Evan Witters to form a task force. Um, including faculty and key administrators, such as Paul Headings, our chief uh, academic integrity officer, to address this issue and come up with some potential solutions that could be shared as best practices across the WVU community. Um, you'll hear more about this in spring. If you do have an interest in serving on that task force, please, please notify Dr. Witters. And finally, I want to talk about next steps for the revised university procedures document following the faculty assembly vote. I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm very disappointed on the outcome. I'm disappointed because I sincerely believe that the procedures document is a strong document, one that provides many benefits to faculty along with greater transparency, increased rigor, 
and clear guidelines regarding our current accountability practices. I'm dis disappointed on behalf of the members of my team and the faculty who worked very hard on this project and acted in good faith all along to not only draft the document, but to engage with faculty and seek input across all three campuses and through multiple venues, including 26 in-person town hall meetings. I'm sure we could have done things better, but we did a lot. And we did it with the best of intentions and in good faith. Finally, I'm disappointed that the vast majority of faculty, 75% of the faculty assembly, did not vote on the document that was truly designed for their benefit. Frankly, my team and I had hoped for a more positive outcome to this exercise in shared governance. But we are at an impasse, and there does not seem to be a clear path forward. And frankly, we have a lot of other business to attend to right now, including positioning the university for success in a very challenging financial climate. So rather than spend more time on this matter and try to force the issue, we have decided to accept the results of the January faculty assembly vote. This means the current 2014 procedures document will remain in effect and will continue to guide the faculty promotion, tenure, and annual evaluation processes at WVU. Colleges, departments, and other academic units um, may wish to adopt uh, certain elements from this document into their own promotion and tenure and, and annual evaluation guidelines, and we will certainly work with the units on that who are interested in doing that. Faculty Senate may also decide that you want to tackle it in some way, make suggestions on changes to the administration, which we would certainly consider. But at this point, our work on the document is done, and it is now in your hands. Thank you. All right, so Travis Mullahan, Director of Government Relations, is joining us and is going to provide an update on uh, the legislative session. Travis. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Scott, uh, members of the Faculty Senate, for allowing me to join you virtually. I'm sorry, my camera is not working. Um, hopefully that will correct itself, but good to see you all um, uh, today. Uh, going to run through... Uh, a few high profile bills, happy to answer any questions. There may be some specific bills that you all are interested in that I can provide some information on, um, but I will um, I will run through uh, what I know and, and where we are. So today is day 34 of the 60 day legislative session. There are 26 days left to go. Um, um, as many of you may see, we have been working very closely this year with Marshall University on a number of universities united um, initiatives, both from a messaging um, and strategic standpoint that has worked very well for us and our team, along with Marshall's team. Um, and so we hope to continue um, that, uh, that effort into the future. Um, the budget uh, bill has been introduced, as it always is, on the first day of session. It contains $3.5 million more this year for the universities, uh, for uh, WVU, excuse me. That's specific to the pay raise that uh, Governor Justice and the legislature is proposing, a 5% pay raise. Of course, as many of, uh, of you know, that is not a 5% across the board pay raise. And because the university is only funded about 15% of our budget um, from the state, uh, we are not given um, an amount of money to cover uh, every employee getting a 5% pay raise. Uh, so I know Rob Alsop and his team will, will be communicating more um, once the budget is approved on what that pay raise can mean for our campus. Um, three of the big items that the legislature and the governor are focused on that many of you all have uh, uh, probably seen uh, is tax reform, PEIA, and DHHR. So just to give you kind of a rundown of what's going on with those three topics, um, the governor proposed a tax reform package that was a 50% cut to the personal income tax. 
that would have happened um, immediately the first year, 30%, and then 10 years um, over the next two years. The House passed that bill pretty quickly and sent it to the Senate. That would have removed $1.25 billion uh, from the state's revenue. Uh, the state Senate felt that was uh, uh, too big of a uh, tax reform package uh, to pass, given some um, given some financial um, issues coming down the road. And so they have proposed an alternate plan uh, to reduce the personal income tax by 15% with some economic triggers to reduce it further, plus a couple other uh, tax cuts in there. There's a marriage penalty uh, for married couples in West Virginia. Um, there is an expansion of the Homestead Act for um, for um, disabled veterans. There's a rebate process um, considered for the car tax. And then there's a rebate process for small businesses to remove their machinery, uh, inventory, and equipment. So that package actually um, right now is receiving some, some positive comments from both the governor and the House, and, and all three sides are, are working on that. So I suspect uh, we will see some form of tax reform before the legislature um, adjourns on March 12th. PEIA, uh, many of you all probably saw from the beginning of session that the state Senate passed a bill that would uh, increase the state hospital reimbursement rate to 110% of um, Medicare. They did that on day one. Um, but since then, the Senate has started to move Senate Bill 268, which uh, seeks to reform um, some of the components of PEIA. It includes that hospital reimbursement, but it also um, would potentially change some of the coverage criteria for PEIA. They're contemplating um, going back to the 80-20 rule. They're contemplating changing what the benefit could be for spouses on PEIA. And then they're contemplating including um, some money inside uh, that bill that would cover some of those expenses for employees. So that's definitely a bill to watch and we'll keep, um, we will keep, um, campus updated uh, as the legislature considers some reforms to PEIA. And then finally, one of the other big issues is DHHR. Um, the legislature currently is moving a bill that would break up uh, DHHR into three separate agencies. Uh, it would become the Department of Health, the Department of Human Services, and the Department of Health Care Facilities. Um, both the Senate and House are contemplating as well how the funding mechanism um, for DHHR and where the line items within the department would rest amongst those three new agencies. So that's a bill that I think will eventually um, make its way through the process and pass. Um, campus carry, of course, we are uh, following and, and working on Senate Bill 10, which would permit uh, firearms in certain places on campus that passed overwhelming in the state Senate a couple weeks ago. Um, we just received word this morning that there will be a public hearing on Senate Bill 10 in the House chamber on Wednesday at 9 a.m. Um, if any of you are interested in attending and speaking, please let me know. I'm happy to make sure that you know where the location will be and how to sign up. Um, unfortunately, there's an in-person process that you have to sign up to speak, um, but I can help you with that if, uh, if anyone is interested. Um, once that public hearing takes place, we think that that afternoon um, of Wednesday, the House Judiciary Committee will consider the bill um, and likely um, pass it. Um, so once it goes to the House floor, unless there are any changes, uh, we could see campus carry uh, pass sometime early next week um, and uh, head to the governor's desk at some point. Um, additionally, some other issues that we're working on, um, there's been an effort, uh, a few bills introduced to eliminate uh, or change, excuse me, uh, West Virginia's strong childhood immunization laws. Uh, we've been working on that issue for a number of years 
Um, and fortunately, right now, uh, we don't believe that those efforts will move forward to create a philosophical or religious exemption to those strong um, immunization laws, but we're working with health sciences and our School of Public Health and, and other partners in WBU Medicine on that. Uh, additionally, some of you may uh, be following some of the things happening around House Bill 2007, which would um, prohibit certain medical practices related to gender affirming care. Uh, we have several folks, both at WVU Medicine and at the university, that work on those issues. And so we're tracking that bill um, to make sure that the legislature understands what the repercussions could be for our patients, for their families, uh, et cetera. Um, so we're working on that bill as well. And then uh, tomorrow, our student uh, government leaders have been working with the House and Senate on a hunger-free campus initiative um, that's going to start moving in the legislature. And so they'll be joining me tomorrow in Charleston uh, to speak to a couple committees about that initiative. Uh, so right now, that's that's sort of the highlight. If you read under the dome, you can see some of the other bills that are making their way through. Um, there's thousands of bills that are uh, being introduced and considered. Um, so that's my update. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about those, those bills or any uh, other specific legislation that you're uh, interested in. Are there any questions for Travis? I have just one, Travis. Do you know whether the campus carry public hearing is going to be live streamed? It will be, yes. Um, I'm, I can share that with you, Scott, and so you can share it with uh, um, members of the Faculty Senate and others. Great. No other questions? Thank you, Travis, for joining us today. Thank you all very much. The next item on the agenda is a report from Donald Barnes, Kelsey Little, and Melissa Latimer on an upcoming culture. So much for your help. This is just uh, FYI in terms of an upcoming survey that is coming out of talent and culture. I'm here today with my colleagues of talent and culture to talk about it. So let me just go ahead and move this forward. Whoops. Okay. Um, many of you, it was about a year ago uh, that they were talking about the survey. Uh, Maria um, came from uh, talent and culture, and it was actually using the software called Waggle. That software has changed. It's now called Dialogues, but it's the same idea and the same um, survey. Uh, it's intended to be annual. Eventually, it's going to be in the fall, but we're doing it in the spring now because we had two surveys in the fall, and we didn't want them competing with each other. And it's around faculty engagement. Uh, it's really, though, about work culture. And so, uh, this is not a survey to answer every question you ever wanted to know about uh, culture and climate on our campus, but it is a camp. It is a survey that will be asked regularly. Um, the data will be used uh, in ways to generate action items, and leaders will be expected to make uh, changes based on some of the feedback from those surveys. And that will be followed, and, and Donald is going to talk about that. So I just wanted you to be aware um, that. In addition to uh, that presentation, they engaged in focus groups on campus and they made some modifications and they recently sent out an email asking for feedback for those people who had gotten coins uh, in terms of which of the three potential open-ended questions should be utilized and that question has been established. Go ahead. I'll push that one out more. Oh, great. All right. As Melissa said, my name is Donald Barnes. I'm the Director of Leadership and Organization Development. And our unit is tasked with administering the annual culture and engagement survey. Of course, culture and engagement, we know that that's very important to WVU success and to student success. That's why we're always uh, looking at to study that and to see what we can do to make things better in the work environment here at the university. For a quick rundown on the new survey, again, it's uh, called Dialogue by a company named Perceptics. There are 23 questions. There are 22 metric questions. And the very last question is a crowdsourced voting question, uh, which Melissa had mentioned was voted on by past value coin recipients. And that question will be, uh, what can we all do regardless of our position to enhance the student experience? He, of course, can have access 24-7 on any mobile device. Dialogue protects your anonymity. 
You can skip any question and continue with the survey. You can answer as many or as few as you want. And you can see faster results for quick action. And so what we decided to do uh, was to have a couple of town halls across campus to generate uh, enthusiasm and openness to the survey. Um, and so those are scheduled. The first one is February 15th at 1 p.m. And that's uh, Evansdale, February 22nd at 1 p.m. downtown in the Mountain Lair. And we'll be going over in more detail uh, what that survey looks like, uh, as well as what the process will be moving forward. Um, I do want to uh, tell you, though, that there is a website already set up. It has the information in terms of what's been done already, what's coming, the dates for everything, uh, when the survey opens, when it closes, the questions that are asked on the survey, all of that is available, and you can see that. Thank you, Lisa. So just a quick rundown of the timeline and milestones of the 2023 survey. We'll be launching March 21st through April 4th. And then around April 11th, we'll be releasing results to all people leaders on campus. A campus conversation will occur on April 18th, and that's where org-wide participation rates, as well as org-wide results, will be announced to the campus. And then we'll take a little break until we get to the very end of August, very early September. All results will be released to all faculty and staff. And then teams will be having team conversations around their results roughly September 1st through November 17th. And then we'll repeat that again in September of 2024. Any questions? What do you mean, I'm sorry. I've been asked to give an update on the current fiscal year um, financial operations and to talk briefly about our upcoming years. My comments today are basically going to be about the current fiscal year, but I'll, I'll hint at future years, but we're really diving into the current year. Many of you are aware that in January, we reached out after the holidays, we came back and we reached out um, to our deans and our leaders and indicated that a projection that we had been working on in the fall, that we thought we were falling short of that and that we had a sever several million dollar um, deficit that we were working on for the current year. Um, and I know that sounds like a big number, but remember that we are a $1.2 billion university and this is something that we feel like we can tackle. We need to become more efficient. We have a lot of work to do, but we can find ways to um, reinvest, find resources so that we can invest in new ways going forward. So a little history of what brought us here um, this year. As you know, in fall of 22, uh, we came out right away and said that our enrollment, uh, enrollment had fallen short of the number that we used in our budget that was approved in June of 2022. And of course, as the provost mentioned, our overall enrollment number was lower than what we anticipated, uh, partly because our retention and persistence had a slight decline, but more so because we had a better graduation rate, which is great, but overall we have less students paying tuition, so it did cause a large gap for the university of about 14 million. And we came out with that information. We went to the board meeting in September or November and shared that information and we began to work with our leaders across the university to close that gap, um, ask them to reduce expenses so that um, you know, we could go back to our original budget. We issued a spend memo in November asking everyone for really a hiring frost, uh, meaning to look at positions very judiciously, hire those that were necessary for student-facing positions, and again, just to look to reduce expenses. We also asked for um, due diligence when it came to things like travel and hospitality to help get us through the year. But again, when we came back in January, and uh, keep in mind our first estimates of expenses were done in September, October. We only had a few months under our belt, July, August, and September. Our salaries really kick in once the semester starts, and so does our spending. And we really believe that inflation has impacted a lot of our expenses. Uh, everything we do is costing more than it did in previous years. Our utilities are even up. And we believe that there, during COVID, there was pent-up demand on startup costs and hiring, and that people came back for our first real post-COVID year and started to spend, and we can understand that. 
Um, so when we got back in January and we looked, what we noticed was that our expenses, even though we had come out in November and asked for due diligence, my phone is ringing. Um, what we noticed were our expenses weren't declining, that our salaries uh, still were higher and our expenses were higher also. So while we uh, needed to dig into those numbers, we thought it was important to reach out to all of our leaders. Uh, we did so very quickly to all of our deans. And we said we wanted to move from a hiring frost to a hiring freeze, except for those positions that were really student facing, um, important for our enrollment, re, um, retention and persistence, and um, our student experience. Of course, from all of our requests, we left out grant activity. We need that to continue. And anything relating to campus safety, of course, we weren't going to hold back on expenses in those areas. In addition, we asked all of our leaders to take a look at their foundation accounts to see if there were any funds with donor restrictions that enabled them to offset any of their expenses in the current year. Um, we also looked across the university and we delayed many of our capital renovations and our um, even our deferred maintenance projects that we had planned in order to preserve our cash for the, for the year. The other thing we did is we reached out to all of our units across the university and we asked them to help us project what they thought they were going to spend through the end of the fiscal year. So that was a two-week uh, project that was you know, very time consuming, I know, for all of our deans and our chief business officers. And that information was due back last week and we are just combing through that now. We do believe that there was activity on grants that is sitting on state accounts because we had a delay in getting our awards set up. So we're hopeful that there will be some transfers of expenses off of state funds onto grant funds, which would help with our overall situation. We're also hopeful that people looked at these projections under the guidelines of our memo and they aren't going to fill positions and they're going to reduce their spend through the year. And this really wasn't to budget. We weren't asking for savings from budget. We were asking for sincere reduction in expenses to help us get through this year. So we know that all of these steps are going to help us get through the current fiscal year. Uh, we're hope hoping to close the gap, especially from a cash perspective. But we know going into next year that these were one-time uh, resolutions and remediations and that we will still have an enrollment problem for next year. As we continue to have these smaller classes filter through, we have these students for four, five, six years. When we have less students, that's less tuition. So we will begin to work with our board and with all of our leaders as we plan for 2024. And again, we look to do things uh, more efficiently uh, look to see what things perhaps aren't mission critical and reduce our spend so that we can invest in areas that will help us grow, that will improve our um, student uh, activity and participation. We never want to reduce our grant activity, but we really need to start looking at things judiciously as we go forward. And as we get more uh, into our plans for fiscal year 23 and 24, we will continue to report out what we're finding. But for now, it's very preliminary, and we're digging in and trying to get more information. So I'm happy to try to answer any questions anybody may have. Paula, Emily Murphy, CAHS. Have you looked at where the spending is occurring? Because I think as faculty, when we get those messages, I think we've been operating really on bare bones. And now we're being told, like, don't make copies, don't buy pencils. You know, I mean, I needed new ink for a printer the other day, and I had to put it on grant activity. And so, I mean, and I haven't gotten a printer in, or ink cartridge in three years. So, I mean, have you looked at patterns of where spending is occurring, or is this something that's being, like, people are overspending across campus? Is it faculty? Is it at more the administrative level? Um, because I think when we get those messages, it's pretty disheartening to us when we're trying to you know, do our job on bare bones, and then we're getting messages like don't even right. print anything. <laughs> it really is across the university, and we do believe that, um, you know, the cost of everything is more. We have uh, an increase in, in um, staffing across the university, and we'll be reporting on that. Um, you know, we've talked before about um, vacancies across the university, 
Um, and our budget, when it comes to salaries, is a bit of a projection. We know we're never going to fill all of those vacancies, so we count on a vacancy factor. So there's always a chance that there is hiring above the level that we believe is going to happen. We also believe that people are being hired in at higher rates than uh, the people who have left the position. And we have a lot of position reviews that are going on across the university when people come to them and say, I have a better offer to work remotely, and we do adjustments. So salaries across the board are up, um, not just in faculty uh, areas, in the academic areas, but administratively also. Um, and you know, we do understand that it's hard to hear to reduce expenses. We're just trying to get our arms around this and make better plans so that we don't have to come out with these emergency situations and sort of tell people, pencils down, you know, we don't want to do that. We want to plan better to go forward. Yes. Yeah, Dave Hauser, Everly. Um, you said back in the fall it was a $14 million sort of hole. Do you have a better idea of what that number is now, two-thirds of the way through the budget year? Yeah, we are... Um, we are still projecting that based on the information we got back on February 6th from all of our colleges and schools. So we're, we're going to compile that because nobody better could do a projection than our own units. So once we gather that all up, see what perhaps is moving to grants, um, what foundation funds can be used, then we'll be reporting on that. We let our Board of Governors know that we're, we're basically giving the same message on Thursday to our Joint Strategic uh, Finance Committee that we will schedule another meeting in March once we have a better idea of what the projections are. So just to follow up, it's worse than $14 million? You still, still think it's $14 million? I mean, the, re the reductions that we asked for in the fall to kind of close that gap, we weren't seeing those come to fruition. And if our expenditures would continue for the second half of the year at the same level as the first half, it would have gotten worse. So we're trying to stop that. Frankie Tack, Applied Human Sciences. Um, I basically have the same question. Um, I've been asked by a couple of people if it's only several million, um, which was, I think was your starting phrase, and, and then we were told 14 million in the fall, and then we were told it's worse than it is. I think I've been asked by several people, isn't it really worse than they're saying? And, and I think there's some concern that maybe we're not getting the whole picture. I will tell you, you've heard about our ERP modernization that the university is going through. We, we are working um, with systems that don't give us um, the ability to project quickly. It is painful. Um, my, our finance staff across the university have been working really hard to get our best projections. Um, you know, we were worried that it was worse, and that's why we put the statement out that while we continue to dive into this, we would like everybody's best um, participation in reducing expenses. Uh, Jonah Katz, Everly uh, College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I get that uh, new enrollments and, and uh, you know, retention are kind of unpredictable, but I don't understand with all the time we put into putting things into degree works and auditing people's degrees and stuff, why is it so hard to predict how many students we're going to graduate? And is there a plan for trying to make sure that doesn't happen again? Yeah, absolutely. You know, last year was, um, this last fall, was um, the first time we had a miss that was substantial. And so we have put a team together, uh, Lisa Castellino, Evan Witter, uh, Mark, the provost office. We are working with all the projections that our deans give us. And of course, we're working with enrollment management to look at first-time freshmen and transfer. We don't want that to happen again. So, you know, it, it caught us. And, um, you know, that's very disappointing to everyone involved because we do take a lot of time to estimate our enrollment. So, uh, you know, we have everyone on deck to try to make sure that doesn't happen again. Right. Thank you, Paula. The next item on the agenda is my report. Um, as we heard from Travis this morning uh, about the Campus Carry Senate Bill 10, I do want to report that the Senate was on record ahead of that bill moving in the Senate uh, at a special meeting of the Faculty Senate Executive Committee 
So on January 17th, the executive committee passed a resolution on behalf of the faculty senate asking the legislature to maintain local institutional control of decisions related to firearms on campus. That resolution was communicated to the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate ahead of their vote, and Travis still has that resolution and is communicating with the House side of the legislature. Um, Eloise Elliott, who is the representative for state government of Faculty Senate, uh, will speak on behalf of the Senate at the public hearing on Wednesday. A um, couple of other announcements. Nominations for new senators to fill expired terms are now open. Those nominations will close uh, this Wednesday, February 15th. Uh, Senate terms last three years. Senators can be reelected to two consecutive terms. So please encourage faculty who you believe would be good represent representatives of your constituencies to either self-nominate or nom nominate faculty that you believe would serve well in that role. Voting will occur late February and early March, and results will be released uh, in April. We will be accepting nominations from the floor uh, for the Senate chair-elect uh, during the March 6th Faculty Senate meeting. Any member of the University Assembly who has served as a senator uh, in the last three years is eligible uh, to be nominated and to run for the Senate chair-elect uh, position. Faculty can self-nominate or be nominated by other senators. Uh, anyone who is interested in running uh, for chair-elect and wishes to declare their candidacy uh, ahead of the March meeting can do so by contacting me and copying Corey Hunt. Uh, candidates will have an opportunity to make a two-minute campaign statement at the April 10th Faculty Senate meeting. Ballots will be distributed to senators via Qualtrics during the month of April and results will be announced at the May 8th Faculty Senate meeting. We'll be accepting nominations for the position of representative to state government. Uh, the representative uh, to state government uh, is appointed by the Senate Executive Committee, subject to confirmation by the Senate. Um, faculty uh, Senate representative to state government must be a member of the University Assembly. Uh, eligible uh, university assembly members may apply for the position by submitting uh, a statement of interest seven calendar days before the April 24th Faculty Senate meeting. So nominations for that position will close on April 17th. Um, currently, the representative for state uh, government serves a one-year term. Uh, we anticipate changing the faculty constitution to make that a two-year term to, to align with the two-year term on the Advisory Council for Faculty, the ACF. Eloise Elliott is our current representative of state government. We're also going to be releasing the call for Senate committee members in March uh, as we start the process to populate uh, Senate committees for next year. Uh, serving on the Senate committees is a great way to learn uh, what happens in the Senate and to engage in the faculty governance and shared governance processes. Uh, we've heard some concerns about textbooks, orders uh, being late and not available at the beginning of the semester. Frankie Tack volunteered to look into that, and she's going to give us a brief update on progress. So I'm pretty sure this is hazing. I'm not positive, but um, I probably need to find somebody here to report him to. Um, so, yes, I have been looking into this and want to thank Mark and his team for responding so quickly to, to the concerns we raised about how we can maybe go about, um, you know, sort of understanding more about what the textbook acquisition process is and who and how we can get our concerns shared more broadly so that faculty aren't in the position of sort of just these one-off um, contacts and getting one-off problems solved, but if there are some patterns, those can be looked into. So um, Mark set up a meeting with um, himself and Je Jeff Pratt, Procurement Contracting and Payment Services Assistant VP, and Todd Kiger, one of our newer Mountaineers that I met for the first time, who's only been here six months, I think, and he's Director of Procurement. So we had a really good conversation, and I think 
Scott's going to invite Todd to come and march and talk just a little bit about the bookstore processes and some initiatives that are underway to improve that process, particularly around communications with stocking and things like that that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis in our classes. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to just tell you a few things that were my takeaways from that meeting. Um, I learned that there is a quarterly review meeting that um, procurement has, the procurement team has with Barnes and Noble, and um, they, there has been some interest there. They've been thinking about um, creating a faculty seat on that committee and now have um, gone ahead and, and done that. So um, we'd like to ask if there's anyone here, any um, senator who would be interested in serving in that capacity to be the faculty representative to the um, quarterly review meeting for the Barnes and Noble and procurement, we would like you to contact Scott so that we can go ahead and, and get our voice there and also have a mechanism to communicate back to us what's happening um, in that venue. Also, um, Todd is working to set up a single point of contact in the procurement office. So again, we don't have to do one-offs when we have problems. We can have that single point of contact and then he can also be monitoring for any trends in, in stocking. Um, I mean, the two main issues we heard was Bookshelves, books not being on the shelf at the beginning of the semester, which is a concern for all of us, but particularly uh, short session courses, and then books selling out um, uh, because there, there haven't been enough stock. So they'll be working on that, getting that name to us soon. And um, yeah, Todd is also now getting a report from Barnes & Noble every time there's any kind of issue so that, again, he can track trends over time. So we'll be looking for some improvements, and I guess that's it. So let Scott know if you're interested. Thanks. Thank you, Frankie. I will say that I gave you notice, at least. Ashley would just drop offline on me and leave me there to fend for myself. Last year. Okay, so a couple of Quick comments about the university assembly meeting uh, regarding the proposed university procedures for appointment, annual evaluation, promotion, and tenure. As you know, that meeting was called by a petition that successfully met the threshold to call a faculty assembly meeting. Um, I do realize that meeting seemed a bit chaotic at times. It is quite challenging to run a meeting that large uh, over the Zoom webinar platform that has some limitations. Um, uh, beyond what we normally see in a normal Zoom meeting. I do apologize if I missed a few individuals who were requesting to speak in the Q&A during that meeting. Um, we also did experience some technical difficulties with the Qualtrics ballot in which a preloaded version of the resolution that did not include the two amendments uh, was displayed. We did correct that problem quickly, um, but we're aware that uh, that refresh uh, update uh, was not being seen by all faculty members, probably because their web browser had cached the previous version. Uh, Corey Hunt is exploring other options for uh, to do those ballots um, other than the Qualtrics form. We did manage to meet quorum at that meeting. It took a while. We received a total of 715 votes, um, 221 in favor of approving the document, 494 um, opposed to approving the procedures document. Um, I will say that uh, the participation rate in the voting was disappointing. Um, and it unfortunately uh, allows the interpretation that uh, whether right or wrong, a minority of uh, faculty are able to um, exert control over the majority in the Senate. Um, because such a large majority of the faculty elected not to voice their opinion during the meeting by voting. Um, so I am concerned that that sends an optic that um, the low participation um, weakens the Senate's and faculty assembly standing in our efforts uh, to strengthen shared governance. So we do need to work harder when we call a faculty assembly meeting to get uh, better attendance at those meetings. Um, we have heard that there are things in the new procedures document that faculty like. Um, and the provost did express openness to the faculty senate um, making a counter proposal. 
So over the next few weeks, uh, we'll work to determine whether there's interest uh, from the Senate to work on a proposal to send back to the faculty senate. And that concludes my report. Are there any questions? Emily Murphy again. Um, Scott, do you think, I, I've heard from several people that they didn't realize there was only a two hour window for the vote. Um, and so I don't know if that, if you've heard the same thing, but I do think that that was kind of indicative of why we had some low numbers. I did hear that. Um, uh, so certainly we need to do better messaging uh, around our procedures uh, and the, the time period that votes would be open. Uh, we did want to get that vote concluded so we could announce results the following day. It took us most of the following day just to kind of work through and get the results tabulated. Um, so that was part of the justification for limiting the amount of time the vote was open. But we will work on that messaging and procedures. Yes. Hi, Amy Weiss, Little Everly College. I have a question about the procedure. Are we required to do it during the evening hours when people have other responsibilities that require their attention? And is there an asynchronous way we can possibly increase participation? We know that works for our students. Uh, we're not required to do it during the evening. Hours. We were just trying to find uh, a period when uh, people were available, uh, recognize that that time period may have not been ideal for some who have families and children. Um, kind of looked at the similar time that we did the vaccine mandate assembly uh, as guidance um, and trying to pick a time where potentially people didn't have as many classes that they were doing during the day. So it is certainly challenging to find a, a time period that would work for for faculty, we did the best we could in that. Amy Hessel, Eberly. Um, I just wanted to voice support for the idea that the Faculty Senate would put forward some ideas for uh, an improved document. And I think there's no better group than faculty who have spent long hours on FEC committees to do that. Thank you. Any other questions for me? All right, hearing none. So the next report is from Lori Ogden, Chair of the Curriculum Committee. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick for information item before I get to the approval items in my report. Um, in light of the discussion that we had during the last Senate meeting, I thought it might be a good time to just kind of review the process that the Senate Curriculum Committee goes through when we evaluate programs and courses. So first, I just wanted to mention that all of this information is provided online. Um, the Senate Curriculum Committee has a website that's an extension of the Senate website. Um, there is listed the membership. Um, we try to get membership from the different colleges across the institution as best we can. Um, again, those members are listed on that website. We also include representation from um, non-voting representation from the provost office, from OUR, also from the Teaching and Learning Commons. And, and they really are essential to the work that we do, and we appreciate their support. Um, I feel like I should plug, since you were talking about the uh, committee's membership survey that will be coming out next month, it's a fantastic committee with really great people. So anyone interested in serving on the curriculum committee, we might be your group. Um, just quickly, what the workflow looks like. So again, this is visible in Kim as well. Um, for new programs, um, this is typically initiated in the unit, um, goes to the college, also the provost office, before it gets to the Senate Curriculum Committee, and then it goes on to exec and then to Senate. Um, new degree programs must be approved by the Board of Governors after being passed by the Faculty Senate. There are times when the college initiates programs, especially when the unit doesn't exist or is um, underdeveloped. The approval process for course proposals Again, is similar, although those don't go through the provost office first, but through the unit and college before they come to the Senate Curriculum Committee. 
Um, so just overall in terms of program review. So programs are assigned to reviewers, um, to members of the committee, a primary and a secondary. We encourage everyone on the committee to review the program so we can have a whole group discussion during our meeting. Uh, the committee chair, which is me in this case, will facilitate a, discuss a discussion during our meetings and also takes um, the main role when having any post conversation with the initiator. Uh, we do not review the intent to plan. We don't review things like staffing or budget. Those are all vetted by the provost office during the intent to plan stage. All of this is documented in a summary in the comment section in Kim that is again there for anybody to log in and take a look at. In terms of course reviews, courses are reviewed within two groups. So we typically could have at any given meeting between 75 and over 100 courses to review during our two to three hour meeting. Um, so we divide and conquer. We split into two groups. Um, each course is given a primary and secondary reviewer. And then we have that conversation within our small groups. And we decide together um, how to proceed, whether it's a pass. We try to pass pen things if they're minor changes that we can work with the initiators as we all appreciate how, how timely it is to get things through. Um, reference syllabi came up during the last meeting, and I did want to mention that this is really the preferred syllabus for curriculum approval. Um, our main focus with the syllabus in this case is assessment. So these are not student-facing syllabi. Um, we use these really to make sure that the learning outcomes are measurable and that the initiator has really thought about how those might be assessed. That's really the primary concern of the reference syllabus. And then I just wanted to let you know that even before some of this came up, we've been working together to, I don't want to say revise the process, but maybe better articulate what the process is. So we do have a subgroup of the curriculum committee that is currently meeting and has been. And we've been talking about how we can better clarify what this process looks like at each stage of review. Um, articulate the differences between a reference syllabus and a professional you know, student-facing syllabus, and then also working with the provost office to provide support for professional syllabus development, as we truly believe that's a very important part of the curriculum, just not what's assessed at this stage. That concludes my four information item. I do have a list of items that are for approval. So first, as always, we have the new courses report in Annex 1 and the course changes report in Annex 2. And then we have several programs. So first, we have a program change in art education, a program change in integrated marketing communication, a new program in business ethics and prosperity, a new program in gender inclusive health and communications, associated AOEs. So gender and community area of emphasis, gender and health area of emphasis, and gender and STEM area of emphasis. And last, a new program in public service and leadership. David. Yeah, in light of the Dave Hauser Everly, in light of the program for public service and leadership uh, arriving in the Senate, we tabled some courses at the last Senate meeting. So I would move that we take off the table the courses from the last Senate. All right, so a motion has been uh, posed on the floor to remove from the table the public service and leadership courses that were tabled at the January meeting. Those courses for information are included in Annex 3 that was attached to the agenda. Motion to take uh, something off the table is not debatable, so we'll do a vote. A uh, simple majority vote to take those courses off of the table. We will include them then in uh, today's curriculum report as a for approval item uh, for discussion and um, action. All right, so all those in favor of removing the courses listed in Annex 3 from the table, please raise your hand. We're taking it back off of the table so we can act on it. 
Now, the motion is to take them off of the table so we can act on them at today's meeting. Doesn't mean we're approving them or anything else. Just bring them back. I do need a second. Sorry. All right, it's been seconded. Please raise your hands again. My mistake. How many did we have, Dave? 44 in the room. We had 11 online, so 55. All those opposed to taking the courses listed in Annex 3 off of the table, please raise your hand. So we have one vote opposed. All right, one and one online, so two votes to oppose removing those from the table. Dave? Need additional motion to attach them to the stuff to be voted today, or are we good? I think we can attach them to the stuff being voted today. All right, Lori. Uh, so discussion. So uh, discussion on the new courses, um, the course change report, uh, the program changes, and the new program report. Is there any discussion? Questions, comments, before we take a vote on today's curriculum report. Hi, Lindsay Reinhardt, Everly Arts and Sciences. This is maybe more of a process question. Um, as we have, I appreciate the overview about what the curriculum committee does and doesn't do. And we hear a lot about academic transformation. As we're developing new programs, how, how is that kind of going together? How are we looking at the developing of the new programs as other programs are maybe being sunset? I think that would just help as we are voting about new programs. So that, I believe, is taken care of in the intent to plan stage, um, where the new programs are proposed first to the provost office uh, in that intent to plan. Um, and there, there is an approval process that happens at that level before it's brought to the Senate Curriculum Committee. That I, it doesn't necessarily fall currently within the, the purview of the Senate Curriculum Committee and Senate approval process. I guess the only thing, Dave Hauser, ever the only thing I would add to that is two points. Uh, one, directly related to the PSL courses. We had multiple meetings on this in the last month. Uh, the the folks in the Eberly office, uh, Dean's office, have committed both to work with the faculty in the Rockefeller School to iron out some of the issues on this particular course proposal uh, and, and courses uh, to make them whole sort of moving forward and fix all the issues that have been brought forward by some of the faculty. Secondly, the Eberly Dean's office has committed to making a little bit more transparent uh, the process by which courses and proposals move through Eberly. Uh, and uh, the Senate leadership has also discussed the idea of making some of those intent to plans more public. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, maybe Lou can speak to this, uh, the intent to plans are not public at any stage. In other words, uh, the first time the faculty kind of hears about these programs is when they pass through the Senate Curriculum Committee in many ways. Uh, and so as, as noted, if there is going to be discussion about this, it would sometimes be helpful to hear about those things before they're fully developed or proposed. But that's something the Senate's sort of working on. Any other questions or discussion about the curriculum report, including the PSL courses and the PSL program? All right, so seeing none, uh, we will bundle the new courses report, the course change report, uh, the program change report, and the new programs into one votable item. Any discussion or questions regarding? those annexes. All right, seeing none, all those in favor of approving the curriculum report, please raise your hand.
45 in the room, Frankie, and 17 online. All those opposed to approving today's curriculum report, please raise your hand. Seeing none, those changes are approved. Thank you, Lori. All right, the next report is from Lisa DeBartolomeo, Chair of the Education and Foundation, the General Education Foundations Committee. I believe Lisa is joining us online today. Lisa, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, I'm, I apologize for not being there. I do have uh, no report this time, but I promise we will have one uh, next time we have to go through executive committee, but we've been working on compiling a list of general education definitions and looking at other institutions and trying to come up with the best way to frame general education across the country. So by next month, we will have a report for you, I promise. Any questions for Lisa? All right. Thank you, Lisa. Next item on the agenda is a report from Diana Davis, Chair of the Teaching and Assessment Committee. Diana. Good afternoon, Diana Davis, School of Medicine. Um, the TACO Committee has continued to be extremely busy um, over the holiday season. The subcommittee of the ESCI Comment Redaction Committee met. I would like to acknowledge Dave Hauser, Marina Galvez Perez, excuse me, uh, Jolene Bidwell, and myself, and Heather Yates from the Student Judicial Office, who met um, right around Christmas to handle this situation. We had 12 requests for a total redaction of 16 comments. Um, after review, the committee recommended partial redaction of four comments. Um, we're working hard to try to balance the intent of the feedback versus the way in which it was written by the students. The comments uh, redacted this semester included comments that referred to behavior in um, someone's personal life that did not affect the classroom experience and a recommendation for an investigation of employment, which was just grossly inappropriate. Um, the other major task of our committee is the new evaluation, student evaluation of teaching instrument, the student perception of teaching instrument. Um, we had our first go of that this past um, in December. We're currently, we have sent out a survey to faculty members who use the new tool to receive feedback from them for possible modification of the tool um, and to just get their general perceptions of the experience. We have uploaded a um, three pieces of continuing development material to support individuals in the pilot, including um, information on how to choose and customize the survey instrument, information for review committees on how to use the instrument as part of a holistic review of teaching, and information for faculty on how to discuss their results in their annual teaching narrative. And that has all been posted and it's linked off of the TACO webpage through the Faculty Senate webpage. Are there any questions for Diana? Thank you, Diana. Next item is the Committee on Committees report from Chair Leslie Cottrell. Hello, Leslie Cottrell, School of Medicine. Um, I just want to second Lori's comment about the March survey that you mentioned was coming out. This is, gives us a chance to not be reactive and be more actively involved in our committees, our extensions of our purpose of the Senate. So, and um, those are senators and non senators. So, if you get this, please fill it out. Please think about time. We have committees that vary greatly on one hour to multiple hours. Based on your investment, I'm happy to answer any questions. Our committee um, will answer any questions you have as you're finishing the, the survey. But please think about doing it. That's how we're actively involved as senators and faculty at large. So with that, after that being said, I have something for approval, which um, I appreciate Dr. Palmer's service. He is um, taking the place of a colleague in the Applied Health Sciences for faculty welfare. And that's up for approval. All right. So motion to so um, approval item to approve that one committee change to the faculty welfare committee. All those in favor of approving that committee change, please raise your hand. All right. 
Thank you. Any opposed to that committee change? Thank you for that passage. All right, the next item on the agenda is a report from our representative to state government, Eloise Elliott. Eloise. Thanks, Scott. Um, and thanks to Travis. I won't repeat any of the things he already said about the current bills that we're most concerned about. I do want to say something about um, Scott mentioned the public hearing on Senate Bill 10, which will be Wednesday morning at 9. And we encourage any faculty that want to come and speak um, about Senate Bill 10. To, to come to Charleston. I'll send out an email in the morning with more information. If you, if you or any of the faculty that you work with would like to come and speak, if you'll send me that information, then I can communicate with you while we're in Charleston. Um, also, we are being asked to speak to the Judiciary Committee as a faculty. And so any thoughts that you have related to how this bill affects you, or your students, or your teaching. If you could send that information to me, that would be helpful. It would give us more input related to how everybody feels about that bill. So just uh, send any information you have to me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Eloise. Are there any questions? OK, so Stan Howman is out of town today. Uh, but the Board of Governors have not met since the last Senate meeting, so Stan had no report for today. Next Board of Governors meeting is February 17th. All right, is there any new business for today? All right, seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? Do I have a second? We are adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>